Welcome to Ramble City. The tenor from Oz, Paul Taboni, is here. We, uh, it's been a long time since we've seen each other. This is going to be uh, kind of a really fun catch-up, but we're going to talk about music from him later. Um, but first of all, Paul, welcome to the show. Welcome to Ramble City. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. So you are currently performing in the new production of Phantom of the Opera at the iconic Sydney um, Sydney Opera House, or in the Sydney Harbour, I should say. I know it's the longest running musical in in like theatre history. It's like paid, played 35 years in the West End, 34 in New York. But I wanted to sort of test you a little bit. I wanted to put you under a little bit of pressure. I wanted to see you okay. sweat a little bit. I wanted okay. to see if you can give us like an outline of what the show is about. So if you got like a synopsis you can give us for people that don't know Phantom, because some people might not know what this show is. I mean. Well, you, you know, you're right, actually. You know, the... I've been in London, you know, for the last five years, and you would think having such an iconic show in the right in the middle of town that people would be like so familiar with it, having grown up their whole lives and it be there. But actually, because it's there all the time, people just go, "Oh, I'll see it another time." Right? You know, oh, it's it's going to be there. I'll see it another time. So actually, you meet these people and go, "Oh my God, you're in Phantom. <laughs> Have you seen it? No." <laughs> You know? but, I, but I but I've heard it's really good. I've heard I've heard it's quite famous. Look, it is a very well known show. <laughs> I mean, let's not muck around. Well, tell it's me. Been... So so tell me what what's it about, real quick. Give us like the 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 thirty second synopsis. It's about a scary dude that falls in love with a chick, and I mean, it's my I mean, story, you, but whatever. You've pretty much, you've pretty much hit it on the head. It's about it's about a man who was taken from a circus sideshow right. um, by a woman who was in the show and who has raised him in the um, labyrinth of the bottom of the Paris opera. And he grows to become a prodigy, a genius in so many different things, including music. Um, and then, obviously, he becomes obsessed with a young uh, dancer called Christine who he trains through the... Uh, echo chambers of the opera house into her room and he uses this um, pseudonym of an angel of music, of this ethereal person. And she, because her father was also a violinist, um, she thought that it was her father teaching her how to sing her whole life. Right. But it was actually it was him. actually him. Wow. Yeah. So and that's really clever kind of toxic stalker behavior. I mean, it's like I mean, make them... <laughs> It's like it's clever. I mean, this guy really knows how to manipulate someone to fall in love with him. And in fact, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I tell you, you know, it's it's true exactly what you said. You know, he he did manipulate her. He he did gaslight her. But then she falls in love with Raoul at the same time. Yeah. And there's this toxic love circle there, you know, because actually there is some part of her, you know, and, you know, maybe it's Stockholm syndrome or what, but you know, she does love Phantom, but when she truly sees that he is, he's crazy, yeah. um, you know, there's this epic moment where she goes, um, um, pitiful creature of darkness, what kind of light have you known? God give you courage to show you you are not alone. And she kisses him, you know, and it's the moment that he breaks from this, psychopath that no one's been able to love or touch his whole life wow. to a man, you know, to, a, and person. She kiss, to yeah. a person, you know, and she kisses him and, and he just, yeah, he becomes this man. I, I think that's the most powerful part of that opera, you know, Raoul's there hanging because he's like going to kill him and she kisses him and he just, he loses it, you know, and he, and he just goes, what have I done? You know, and lets her go. It, um, it must be because it's that's a that's an enduring image of compassion right now. Like that's oh, kind yeah. of it's it's like even after all that you've done, even even what I kind of I've been through, it's more I can see you now for who you are and how tortured you are and how much I guess mm. as you said, this character is a genius. It loves music and and was just trying to live it through this muse, this obsession, and and that in itself is pretty haunting. Yeah, I mean, I. I you know, I think after all of the times I've listened to this show now that I would be bored and I still never do. You know, I still never do it. I hear something new every time. It's just, it's incredible. 
Because, I mean, you've you've done this show over, is 1,800, right? Uh, over 1,800 performances? Over 1,600, yeah. Over 1,600 performances, Paul. My yeah, gosh, love, that's, love. that's, I don't know if I, what have I done over 1,600 times? <laughs> like I'm trying to, like I'm trying to think what I've done that many times and you're saying that the show is still interesting to you and you find something new in it every time. I mean, you're contractually obliged to say that and, and we're all very thankful for that. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> but it's amazing. Like, do you have looking at, you know, and so those performances were in L- London's West End. I mean, so, you know, that's a storied theatre theater tradition and, you know, one of the most celebrated shows of all time and that many performances, you know, you're part of theatre history, you know, and is there a night that kind of jumps out to you where you go, you know, whether it was an event or someone coming up to speak to you after a show or a night of a performance, is there anything there that kind of kind of jumps out to you in your, in your mind when you... I mean, in that four and a half year stint, there were so many moments. I mean... I think the first one would have been the 30th year anniversary performance. Like that was just insane. You know, we had 30 years of cast come to the theatre and perform in this gala event, you know, and I met Michael Crawford. It was the first night I met Andrew. Um, You know, it was like an insane evening, you know. Sarah Brightman wasn't there, um, but, you know, everyone was. Like it was just the most insane night and I – that for me was my first ever contract on the West End. I thought that was like, you know, couldn't get better than that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, then we had, you know, private rehears- rehearsals with Andrew and that was just like wonderful, you know. And obviously I was the last cast to have worked with Hell Prince, you know, before he passed away. Wow. Um, and that was that was incredible for, uh, you know, like So people that don't know Hell Prince is a celebrated director, producer, um so pivotal in kind of the tradition of musical theatre in yeah. both America and London. So a big deal and just a, a huge figure in in sort of in, in the field. But yeah, go yeah. on, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So how I mean how, you know, was the original West Side story director. I mean, he's done like so many of the most iconic shows. And yeah. He was just it's surreal, you know. I think I'm very lucky. And, you know, I think to myself often, Bradley, like I my journey and where my mm. road was and what I was doing. I'm very lucky to have done what I did when I did and how I did because I got to do all these amazing things, you know, yeah. um, meet these incredible people. And, you know, I can honestly take that off my bucket list because, you know, sadly I'll never be able to work with Hal again. Um, but I do know what he wanted from that role and what the tradition of that role was. Um, so I'm very fortunate for that. Do you think it's now like a uh – no matter who plays it on now in the future, many years down the track, you know, once you've clocked off 45,000 performances of Phantom of the Opera and they sort of finally wheel you off into the fourth sequel <laughs> that you'll then go start playing in. Um, do you think that, do you think that then you will kind of be the one that's sort of like everyone is now taking aside the next and sort of sharing the legacy of these things? Because you're right, you know, talking to Hal Prince, as you mm. said, is kind of, um, I'm being funny, but it's also there is this part of history that if you love the art form and if you love the music or the theatre or the spectacle or being in the audience or performing in the shows, there is this time that kind of feels like it's coming to an end and a new chapter is beginning, but it feels like there is this line sort of being drawn and you're kind of in the middle of those things, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. Look, you know, ever since COVID, ever since the passing of – of Hal and and the passing of Gillian Lynn, who was the original choreographer too, um, you know, things have changed. You know, that's mm. the reality of it. it. It is, I think, a natural progression. And you know what? I think we also have to be considerate of the times and how a show has to progress for its survival. Mm. Um, and, you know, this new production that I'm doing for Opera Australia, that is a perfect example of how a show changes with the times i mean we have the most spectacle i have ever seen we have fire we have pyrotechnics like it's just incredible um and i think you know with that with that re-envisionment of that production it it will these kind of productions will keep the legacy that hell that jilly made alive you know that show that i did in london that the, the brilliant original production I still 
when I was watching it, was thinking, God, in the 1986, this must have been. <laughs> this just must have blown their minds. Blown their minds, you know, <laughs> um, because it's so cool. Yeah. You know, it's so great. The chandelier um, comes down in what feels like slow motion now, you know. Yeah, well, like, it, it, it was a lot more dangerous once upon a time. Like, yeah, that's people right. felt like their heads were going to fall off in the front row, you know. <laughs> but, Is the union yeah. going to let us do this? It'll be fine. Yeah. It'll be fine. You'll be fine. You, there's a, there's a, it's a chain to the roof. Everything's fine. Everyone calm down. <laughs> Look, yeah. let's take a quick break. Let's take a quick break and let's sort of, um, let's talk more about this stuff. I've got a quiz that I'm going to give you to see how well you know Phantom and then we're going to talk about your stuff. And, okay. and I've got some questions about classical music for you. I need to understand this. We'll take a quick break. All right, so we're back with Paul Taboni, the tenor from Oz, uh, talking about Phantom of the Opera, about his music, about a whole bunch of things. I've got a quiz that I'm going to give him later, but Paul, before we continue on Phantom, I need to ask you about, not many people know that I started as a classical singer. You know you were there. Um, You saw the glory that was my Tessaratura. Um, no, <laughs> when I say it, it sounds like a spaghetti. It doesn't sound like singing. Um, but so, you know, you know this stuff. You've been there. But what I wanted to ask you, and I wanted, what I think a lot of people wonder is why is classical singing so hard? So, why is what you do when we listen to you sing and this sound that comes out, why is that so different from kind of contemporary music or pop music? Can you give us kind of an insight into that? Because I think what happens is, is someone like you opens your mouth and sings and you go, what the bloody hell is that? That's mm. huge. That's a, an incredible sound. How does this happen? So uh, it's a big question, but see if you can sort of try to explain that to us lay people. Look, I think the difference is that, you know, I believe with contemporary voice, you, there is – Everyone is born with a voice. Everyone right. is born with a voice who can sing somehow, somewhat. You know, some are more classical in nature, some are more contemporary in nature. But it's the study between contemporary and classical music that makes that differs between an artist. You know, I can be when you met me, I was not a trained singer. Really? You know? No. I was so not we should singer. we should tell people we met when ten oh, how many years ago twelve years twelve years ago yeah but we don't need to say yeah. any more that's all I need to know no. that's it <laughs> 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 all right so you're saying that so I mean yeah so where I am now I'm a contemporary singer I'm singing rock and roll music and where you are as a classical musician so you're sort of saying that the trajectory we take and the the scholarship of our art is defines our voice is that what you're saying or we have that in us and it's just up to us to kind of go as far as our voice can take us i think that's the the you know the second option you've given me is exactly what it is you know i you know as a contemporary singer you know the reality is you do have to train you know yeah. you, you trained you you are you have a classical ba- background you know what i'm yeah. saying like me, me, but, me, me. <laughs> still there still, still there. there still got it <laughs> We got some stories to share, mate. Don't hey, we? Yeah, yeah, that's that's oh, for the man. that's for the uncut edition. Oh yeah, and um, yeah, but you know, I think like in reality, you know, I you have to go and train very specifically in a certain method, um, you know, and the opera world is such a dog eat dog world. Like it's, mm. you know, I personally, I I did my time that in opera. But, you know, my heart always lied in musical theatre. And I, I, was, I studied in that when I was in Australia. I moved to opera after doing musical theatre. Right. Um, but, you know, I realised soon after, you know, I study, I still study now. I study every every day. I do my singing and I once a week do a singing lesson. Yeah. Um, it's, it's pivotal, you know, to maintain the art form. And I think that's the difference, mate. You know, like... I'm sure that there are contemporary artists who do do singing lessons all the time and still maintain their form. But with an opera singer, it is you have to. Otherwise, yeah. it, it goes away, you know? It, that's that's interesting. It is because I think a lot of musicians, that's probably something that's really, really good for for any kind of artist that kind of listens to this show and and myself included hearing you talk about it. I think we, we can sometimes not give enough um, – importance or kind of not plan enough around how we actually keep up what we're doing. So if you're a songwriter, they say write songs every day. And if you're a singer songwriter, you should, you know, you probably just think I'm going to gig on the weekend or I've got this tour coming up and you prepare for that. But there's probably a system that everyone should be taking about every day. I should probably be planned through my, 
my 20 songs or whatever it is. If you're a singer songwriter, I'm, I'm holding a guitar here like James Taylor, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, the same way that, you know, I'm a big basketball fan, the same way that these guys get up and shoot this same amount of shots yeah. every day, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. kind of, it's great to hear you talk about that kind of crafts, that craftsmanship, you know, that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so it's strange, you know, because I was ignorant um, when I went into this world because, you know, opera, it is very hard, you know. It's it's hard. I've heard wise. that. I've heard you that. Know, it's quite it, hard. It I've hard, heard that. You know? yeah. And I think that's where this whole elitism comes from because we, you know, go and sing three hours on a stage, and you know, and we got this idea that we're better than people. Yeah, you got to have a lie that. down. You know. Oh God, we have a lie down. Bloody oath, you know. Yeah. But then I go to Phantom, and I sing eight shows a week. Yeah. And I have to walk out on stage and sing. I think every show I sing over fifteen top C's. Wow! You know? So you times that fifteen by sixteen hundred shows that I've done, you then understand why technique is important and why you have to study every week. So tell you me, know? can you can you give can you give us a how warm are you right now? Have you warmed today? I just, I just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> so the only top C you're going to give us is falsetto. Yeah, know. exactly. But top, the top C, anyone that's wondering, is just high. It's just a really, really high note. It's like the top of your register. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. one of the questions that I kind of had here I was going to ask you was, um, you know, it was about this this classical music feeling a little like where does it kind of, where does it fit in the world or kind of, you know, around in my world and every person's world is different because opera feels a bit like a cult club. Yeah. You know, it feels kind of like it's historical, it's celebrated, it's ritzy. It kind of feels like a regal fight club for singers. Mm, like it's yeah. like fight club for singers where you sing to the death and no one talks about opera club or something. You know, no one yeah. talks about it. But it's like it's it's serious business, you yeah. know? I mean, I'm, I'm not about it, mate. You know, I, Really? I, I, no, I'm not about it. Like, wow. I, I was in there in that world Um enough like i can say that i was working professionally in opera for maybe eight years yeah and you know that time um it made me realize like you know we the, the art form is dying and there is a reason why right wow that's there is so a, interesting. a big oh. reason why because i think this elitism that that people have associated with opera and how many opinions there are in the world of what it should and should not be does not leave any artistic room for artists anymore Wow. You know, wow. that's my, that's my, why I left that world because I didn't want to be dictated how to sing, when to sing, where to stand, how to, like, it, I just, it was, for me, it was prison. At least with musical theatre, we are there to tell a story and even in a show that has gone 35 years, right, yeah. and has 35 years of history of blocking, I was still able to take something of myself and bring it to that stage. And that is what I missed in opera. You know? it's, yeah, it's funny hearing you talk about it because often, you know, big uh, big musicals are, are referred to as kind of the shows where you don't have a lot of creative expression because it's like hit this mark and, you know, hold your arm at a 45 degree angle and sort of raise it like this and, and, and then get off stage, please, very quickly. And it's sounding like that's not particularly the case or it's not as much as opera and it's like way more freedom, which is, a which, lot is more. which is amazing. I mean, I was there for four and a half years. I did a lot of additional things that were not in the script, you know, and a lot of my improvisations that I was doing in London have now been written into the script. That part you where know? you came on with a chest, chest of cat and just started patting it, like <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, where well, you exactly. grabbed it from the alley, just came straight <laughs> on and go, just trust me, guys, trust me. Trust me on this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great idea, trust me. All right, let's take another quick break. Let's come back and we're gonna. T I'm going to quiz Paul on, on Phantom of the Opera and see how well he does. I've gotten uh, five trivia questions and we're going to see how he scores. We will be right back. Paul Taboni, the tenor from Oz, is here. We have just actually just tried to do this quiz um, and we just cancelled the quiz because we found out <laughs> that the quiz is wrong. Um, if you do that... So what we did, we'll break it down for you real quick. We went through this quiz. Uh, Paul did awful. He didn't get any of them right. And he's claiming, he's claiming that it's because the quiz is wrong. And to be honest, I think I think he's actually telling the truth. So we're not going to do it. <laughs> we might do it in the future, but um, unfortunately we can't do it today. So Paul, tell us about 
tell us about what music is coming out at the moment. What are you working on? Uh, well, you know, I've, we spoke a little bit about, you know, this elitist kind of idea that I have that I believe is the reason why opera is not doing so well at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, during lockdown, um, after I finished in London and when Corona started, um, you know, I had this time to, you know, start putting together an idea of an album that I wanted to make and some music that I wanted to put out that kind of encourage the a person to maybe appreciate opera because of the music medium that was being used so yeah. i i i was really and i'm passionate about that you know i was a singer like you know you know of for the pavarotti foundation and pavarotti was huge in trying mm. to um build these bridges between the two worlds of contemporary and, and classical music um he was a huge uh, promoter of this and so was bocelli you know everyone really tries to bring opera to the masses. And that's something that I wanted to do as well. Um, so I made this album uh, called This Is Me, where I sang all of the songs that mean something to me, all contemporary songs, in a way um, that was operatic. Mm. Um, and I've continued to do that now. And it's and it's done really well. You know, I've gotten some really good feedback. And um, now I'm uh, with Ambition Entertainment, who you know well. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I've released this brand new album called This Is Me, which is, you know, I, I love it. Every song means something to me. There's my mum's wedding song that is Brian Adams' Heaven. Um, I've seen that in Italian, very classical, um, all the way to I Will Do Anything For Love from Meatloaf, which is my mum's favourite song. Um, so I am now just trying to really promote this idea of classical music through contemporary mediums to help bring opera to the masses. Yeah, so one of my favorite records um, of kind of all time, and it, maybe it was back when I was more, you know, singing classical stuff, and I'm, I'm actually just trying to actually pull up um, the exact name so I kind of, you know, pr pronounce it correctly. But it was an Andre Bocelli record. Um, it was Romanza. Uh, Romanza was one of my favorite records for a long time. Um, some of the stuff, I mean, Conte Partiro was That's obviously right. on that. Um, uh, yeah, there was so many, so many songs on that album. To me, really did live in that. That it was, it was impressive singing. It was beautiful singing. It was lyrical and it was passionate and it was, it was someone actually singing. You know, yeah. And then fun. it was arrangements that kind of put that voice in a place that felt more more likely to be played on our radios and 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 to be in performance spaces as opposed to on these opera stages and it kind of you're right it did to me feel listening to it it, it sort of i related to it more than i did when i listened to a live recording of la boheme of puccini singing in and you know there's a couple of arias i would listen to because at the time you go well they're the good ones you've got to listen to them yeah the rest just doesn't speak to you you don't know what's going on you don't speak the language yeah. so it really was kind of it really was a vehicle for me to to appreciate classical music a lot more. So that's very exciting, and and all you know, and that's good wonderful. on you and the team for for sort of going down this route. Yeah, look, I, that, I think that's a perfect example of what I hope to do. You know, and you know, my team behind me. You know, the, you talk about Romanza, Robin Smith, who's my producer. He wrote so many of those songs um, for that yeah. album. You know, like it's he knows what people in the middle and you know he always uses this analogy of the housewife in the middle of texas yeah what they think opera is yeah and it's a lot more than people who actually listen to opera it's a lot more people and that's yeah. who i i really want to bring my voice and music to well that's so great well thank you for sharing it with ramble city thanks for trying the quiz with me and i'm sorry i didn't work up we'll have to do it again next time uh, in a better way but um you know, we're such a fan of your work here at the show and so glad that we could sort of catch up here on the show. And, you know, uh, everyone can sort of check the show notes or check um, the comments below in this video to, to go and find out more or see other links to check out more from Paul and music and all that sort of stuff. Go to our Ramble City playlist on Spotify if you want a quick place to find music. But otherwise, be sure to, um, to, to go and follow and find, find out I guess, tour dates and new music and all sorts of stuff, right, Paul? They can go and find that at the website. Yeah, absolutely. There's everything there. It's all in, in its category, so yeah. It's either that or just wait outside our houses and we'll sing you a song for five bucks directly. <laughs> we take cash and we take, um, we take card. All right, thank you so much. Let's get out of here. It's great to see you, mate. Thanks, mate. See you later. 
Well, that's it for another episode of Ramble City. Thank you so much for for sharing your ears with us for another week. Don't forget that you can go and follow us on YouTube, look out for Ramble City Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, you can sign up to my mailing list at Bradley McCaw Official. But uh, this episode has been brought to you by OFM. It's been produced, hosted, and, uh, well, a couple of other things, I guess, by me, Bradley McCaw, engineered by Kana Stats, video designed by Axis Productions, and edited by the great Kana Asbert, original sound design by Matt Erskine. And that is all of us. Goodbye for another week. Keep smiling. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. This has been Ramble City a podcast of conversations with interesting people musing on art, life, and their careers. Created and produced by Old Fashioned Media. To hear more and discover additional material from today's episode, visit ofm.com. Listener.